Hello. The Secret History of the World Wide Web by Philip Van Baker. Part 1. The Need to Know. As I'm speaking, it's March 2011 and the internet revolution has become a real revolution. A wave of protest calling for democracy has swept across North Africa, dismissing a dictatorship in Tunis, another in Egypt, and threatening Colonel Gaddafi's dictatorship in Libya. How could this happen? How could the internet, how could the web have such unintended consequences? How could dictators be taken down by social media? How could something like Twitter and Facebook have such far-reaching effects? Well, to an extent, really, these effects are being overstated. But in another sense, this view that we're getting of these changes is completely false because these changes, these events, are not unintentional consequences of the web. They were intentional. They were the point. I know because I was there. I was there when the web was designed at CERN. I was there when it became a global phenomenon. I was part of the development of the web and for the past 20 years I've been involved in its growth. Because the thing is, the web is more than simply a technology or a nice pretty user interface. The web from the start was a cause and the cause was freedom. I got involved in the development of the web after meeting Tim Berners-Lee at the Computing in a High Energy Physics Conference in Annecy in 1992. This is a conference that takes place every year and it moves from one place to another. That particular year it just happened that it was being hosted by CERN. And after the main schedule one day there was a rump session on the web where Tim showed his uh, stuff. and. I attended that uh, kind of involuntarily. My boss came to me and said, Oh, Phil, you've got to come and see this. This is great. This is hypertext. And I'm sort of like looking, Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. This is going to be hypertext. Because the thing is that at the time, hypertext was far more hype than text. There are a lot of people who are really, really, really enthusiastic about it. But what they produced really wasn't much to be enthusiastic about. It would consist of five pages that you could flip from one to the other and navigate really easily and cleanly. But that was it. It was a closed world and no way to get your information in there. And plus it would cost a really enormous amount of money to set it up on a large scale. What Tim was showing was subtly different and it was different in ways that really mattered. It was simple, it was easy to use, it was smart. He wasn't going to tell the world, you've got to reformat all your data so it fits into my scheme. He was going to adapt his web so that it would make use and leverage information sources that were already there. So on day one, you could access hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of pages of information using your web browser. As a user, there was an immediate benefit. And so I could see immediately this was a technology that could work, could be practical and could grow. At the time, the computing world was going through a transition. The era of the mainframes was coming to an end and they were being replaced by smaller, cheaper, faster machines. Then we called them microcomputers or engineering workstations. Today you just call them computers. This particular machine here is an engineering workstation called the Next Station and this is a machine that Tim Berners-Lee himself was extremely passionate about because he could see that this is the type of machine that physicists should be using to do their work. Computers in network division, however, disagreed. The establishment there saw this as the future. 
This is the data floor at CERN from 1985. In the background there, you can see a Cray. That's a $15 million computer, and only a small number of really elite research establishments had one. And that's not the only goodie they have on the floor. All told, told easily $100 million worth of equipment, probably as much as 150. Out of shot, there's also a six-core IBM 3090. There's a vaccine. There's a lot of money invested there. And that's the type of vision the Computers and Networks division had of how computing should operate. Centralised, dominated by big machines and big budgets. Where the web comes in is if you wanted to use one of if you wanted to use a workstation as your daily machine, you had a problem. You see, the mainframe mafia made it as difficult as possible to use that machine effectively. They made sure that the mainframe was where all the support dollars were spent. The mainframe would be where all the experimental data would be found and all the catalogues for that data and all the information you needed to do your daily job as a physicist. Even the phone book. It was on the mainframe. So the core genius of the web was freedom on a small scale. It was a very simple equation. If you had the workstation and you had the web, you had on your desktop the same power as CERN VM, in that you had all the scientific processing power at your disposal, and all those information systems that were being held hostage by the mainframe mafia, you could access them as well. And that's the reason why the web suddenly started to spread at CERN, because it was a way of throwing off the shackles of the mainframe mafia. It wasn't just an equality, it was better. If you had the workstation and you had the web, your life was so much easier and so much better than having to deal with this old, creaky, obsolete mainframe that should have been in the skip five years ago. The web started as freedom in the small, but it was clear from the start that it was capable of much more. The web began as a way to achieve freedom in the small. Freedom from the mainframe administrators. But it was created at a time when freedom was happening on a much larger scale. 92 was only three years after the year of miracles. 1989, the year in which the Berlin Wall fell and communism collapsed in Eastern Europe. In those days, it was a matter of when, not if, the dictatorships would fall. And one factor that some of us knew had been very critical in pulling down the Berlin Wall was freedom of access to information. Because if there's one thing a dictator really cannot survive, it is freedom of the press. And the, the web was more than just a printing press. It was a printing press at the disposal of anybody with a keyboard and an opinion. And that's the reason why the web has turned out to be so threatening to the likes of Colonel Gaddafi. He's afraid to travel over water and now he's even more afraid of a mouse. So when I'm putting together this talk, one of the thing, comments that I keep getting back is, well, why haven't I heard about this? If you were planning some sort of cyber revolution from the start, why didn't nobody tell me about it? You know, why didn't you let me know before I logged online? You're kind of like, well, as I started writing this, the explanation that I thought I was going to be giving was, well, you know, if you want to create a technology that you think is going to unseat dictators and for it to be effective, you have to get it into their countries. Well, 
you probably don't want it to make it too obvious what you're up to. Now this would be a good explanation but it's not really true because if you've been involved in the internet or the web for any length of time you know that there is a large number of people who talk about nothing else than cyber revolution. In fact, that's the reason why I stayed with the web project in 1992. I was interested in the use of the web as a political tool from the very start. And it was when I found that there were other people involved in the web and in the creation of the internet who had the same point of view that's the reason I stayed. Now the real reason why this particular aspect of the web doesn't come to the fore is because it doesn't really fit into the conventional narratives that have been woven around the web. If you go back to some of the very very earliest stories about the web written by journalists you might find some of it but after a while the journalists start to get an idea of the narrative that they're going to fit the web into and once that narrative has been established each journalist is copying the narrative of the one before. The way that a journalist gets attention for their story is they wrap it up in a narrative that engages the interest of the reader. This is what you're taught at journalism school. So once the narrative of the web had become, well, Tim Berners-Lee is the modern Edison, well, that is the story that appeared in article after article after article. According to Time magazine and the New York Times and the Washington Post and even the BBC, that was the story and that was came out each time. So in this series, what I'm going to be talking about is not the establishment history of the web, it's going to be my history. It's going to be the history of the web told from my point of view as somebody who was part of the discussions and the collaborations that brought it from being a small technology with a hundred people using it to a global technology. Tim Berners-Lee is not the modern Edison. He's the modern Tim Berners-Lee. We don't need to fit the story of the web into some sterile century-old narrative. The history of the web is far more important and far more interesting than that. So over the course of these podcasts, I'm going to be looking at specific events that were instrumental in the development of the web. Some of the events themselves may be known to you already but unless you're really tightly connected into the internet community the background story almost certainly isn't. Most people know that there's a web server at the White House but not that that web server played a really important part in the development of the web itself. Some of you will know that there was an enormous struggle to have the freedom to use strong cryptography in web applications. The crypto wars, as some people know, but there I'm very sure the full story has not come out. Why tell this story? Well, first, I think it's interesting. But secondly, because there's a need to know. Because the web is much more than a tool to destroy dictatorships. I'm not an anarchist. I'm not interested in just breaking down governments for the sake of it. What comes next? How do you build? What replaces it? Toppling a dictator can be quite easy. But what do you put in its place? That's the problem that the Russian revolutionaries found. The Mensheviks got rid of the Tsar, but they didn't have an idea 
of what to replace them with. The Bolsheviks did, and so they pretty quickly replaced and eliminated the Mensheviks, and the result was Stalin. You have to know what is going to come next. And that is one of the things that we talked about very early on in the development of the web. The web is not just a tool for breaking down governments. It's a tool for building governments. It's a tool for building civil society. When I returned from the Annecy conference, I started telling everybody I knew about the web. And one of the people I talked to was John Gill. And John Gill at the time was running the Clinton Gore 1992 online campaign. This part of the Clinton Gore campaign was putting out all the campaign press releases onto the internet so that everybody who had internet access could read them not just journalists who are accredited to the campaign. And this was part of a wider strategy they had called disintermediation, where they were looking to empower the individual voter, the individual citizen, with information about their government. When I talked to Jock, I said, look, this web is something that can be very important. This is a tool that you can use to achieve that disintermediation strategy. And for some reason, Jock took me seriously when we had maybe a hundred people in the world using the web. The web is much more than a tool of destruction. It's a tool of construction. And that is what I think the demonstrators and the protesters in North Africa need to look for it for now. Because one of the things that holds a dictatorship together is not just the fear of the dictatorship itself, but the fear of what might replace it. The web is a tool that was designed to build civil society. And that's what I'm going to be talking to in the next instalment of The Secret History of the World Wide Web. Thank you for watching.